It's Tuesday, January 21. This is the news on PBCJ. I am Simone Absalom. January 24 to January 25 have been designated National Cleanup Days. The government is calling on households across the island to participate in the cleanup days as it's geared towards eradicating mosquito breeding sites and beautifying communities. This as the country continues to grapple with dengue outbreak. Speaking on the OPM Connect program on Monday, Health and Wellness Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton said the country should use every strategy to combat... The challenge is primarily how we control breeding sites yes. in the first instance. And so one of the things that we try to do over the course of the year is just to provide public education and information through our thousand temporary vector workers by visiting homes, treating water uh, that we we identify as breeding sites or possible breeding sites. And of course, uh, just trying to encourage Jamaicans to recognize that the first line of defense really rests with them, mm. given that many of the breeding sites fall in and around the homes. Yes. Beyond that, it's a treatment at hospitals and we've seen over 1,500, actually over 1,600 hospitalizations during the course of last year and tragically, about 80, 80 deaths. Acting Chief Medical Officer Karen Webster Carr gave a breakout on the persons affected by the disease. So far for 2019, we had 8,290 persons with dengue, suspected, presumed, and confirmed. And we had 1,066 in 2018. To date, we have had as Minister told us, 1692 admissions to hospital in 2019. Mm -hmm. And 96% of them went home alive. The others, we understand, died. So these are the more simpler numbers to give. Dr. Tofton says the government is not sparing any cost. We have, however, as a government deployed as much resources as we thought necessary to deal with the challenge. I mean, never before have we seen so much spent on the dengue challenge. And we will continue to do so until we bring the, the situation under control. Thanks to a $54 million donation from the National Housing Trust, the Bureau of Standards Jamaica will be shortly commencing the development of affordable housing utilizing bamboo. According to the Director of Special Projects at the BSJ, Gladstone Rose, the project will get underway in February with demonstration units being placed at various NHD sites for the construction sector to have first-hand view of the houses. Mr. Rose said the building sector is being encouraged to utilize the bamboo technology, noting that, quote, we have to build to withstand earthquakes and hurricanes, and this is what bamboo will help us to do. End quote. He noted that new jobs are on the horizon as bamboo products are produced, adding that the BSJ is providing training in furniture, manufacturing and other areas. Interested persons can contact the agency and get registered for the various skills development. Through a collaborative arrangement involving the BSJ, University of Technology, University of the West Indies and private sector groups, Research was undertaken for the incorporation of bamboo in construction with the aim of building attractive low- and middle-income houses and tourist cabins. United States Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is scheduled to land on Jamaican soil Tuesday evening for a two-day working visit. Pompeo is expected to be met by government officials led by Minister of Foreign Affairs Camino Johnson-Smith when he lands at the Norman Manley International Airport shortly after 6 p.m. On Wednesday, the U.S. Secretary of State is slated to attend several meetings, including bilateral talks with Prime Minister Andrew Holness at Jamaica House, a sit-down with regional officials, and a policy discussion presentation in New Kingston. No agenda has been released for the series of talks, but it is expected that Pompeo will use his trip to consolidate regional support for the U.S. stance on Venezuela.
Minister with Responsibility for Education, Carl Samuda, should make a statement in Parliament Tuesday afternoon regarding the resignation of Council Chairperson of Caribbean Maritime University, Hyacinth Bennett. The Council is the body that provides over the affairs of the University. The development follows a stinging special audit report by the Auditor General's Department detailing procedural breaches and mismanagement at the CMU. According to insiders, several members of the Council have resigned in recent days. A special audit report has shed light on a trail of questionable spending, human resource breaches and other violations of government protocol at CMU. The revelations have again thrust Ruel Reed, the embattled former Minister of Education and CMU President Professor Fritz Pinnock into the limelight days before they are slated to return to the Kingston and St. Andrew Parish Court to face corruption, fraud and misappropriation charges. In a related story, the Caribbean Maritime University says it will not make a public comment um, at this time on the findings of the Auditor General's Department's special investigation into the institution's operations, as it says the report is to be ventilated in Parliament. The CMU says while it acknowledges that the public is awaiting answers, it believes it should allow the Public Accounts Committee, PAC, to fully examine the issue highlighted. Uh, the university says it continues to cooperate with the investigative body and parliament. Port Royal residents are still basking from Monday's historic docking of the first cruise ship, the Morella Discovery 2, to the town. More than 2,000 visitors stormed Port Royal, enjoying tours, food, crafts and more in what was once reputed the wickedest city in the world. Prime Minister Andrew Honus Tourism Minister Edmund Bartlett and Minister of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport Olivia Babsy Grange was part of the group of dignitaries on hand to welcome the visitors. After a day of sightseeing, shopping, enjoying local cuisine and all-round fun, the visitors were treated to a concert in the evening. Minister Grange described the day's activities as a successful dry run with positive indication of the city's economic future. Port Royal has a rich heritage and all our guests who arrived today, they were in awe. They could not believe what they, they, they uncovered coming here to Jamaica and coming to Port Royal. And Port Royal has also been, has come today a gateway for the city of Kingston. And so there were tours outside of Port Royal and those tours went very, very well. Minister Grange lauded the Port Authority the agency responsible for the project. She spoke of the impact this new economic activity will have on Port Royal and the city of Kingston. Because it's creating opportunity for our artisans, and for her, our performers, and it, it, it will impact on the ordinary man too, you know, the people who do their cut cakes, the people who um, sell Jamaican crafts, there are a number of artisans from Port Royal who have made jewelry, they've done batik, they've done chasing, they've done a lot of craft items, and they're now benefiting from what Port Royal has to offer by being able to sell their craft to visitors. So it, it will have a tremendous impact on our people, and particularly on the people of Port Royal. As for concerns about the residents being left out of the profits, she had this to say. There was that concern, but it's unfounded. And, you know, the residents of Port Royal right now, they are, they are saying that they are they're so happy, they're overwhelmed. And those who were not as involved now want to be involved and they want to be given the opportunity. We had trained a number of the Port Royal residents that they would have been able to make use of this opportunity and it has paid off for them. Chief Executive Officer of the Port Authority of Jamaica, Professor Gordon Shirley, said despite a few setbacks, the day was a great success. First of all, let me say it has been a very good day for us. The, as Minister said, it was a dry run and all our technologies and systems have worked well. The, the seawalk, uh, we wanted to ensure that the ground transport system would work well. All of that has gone well. 
The PAJ boss says with the lessons learned from the day's activities and with further plans being put in place by various agencies, we should see Port Royal becoming a model for the rest of the Caribbean. 200 years ago, Port Royal was called the wickedest city on earth. Today, it's a sleepy fishing village nestled in Kingston Harbor and is on the verge of a comeback, but in a good way. On Monday, Port Royal welcomed a Morella Discovery 2 cruise ship, injecting new life and energy into one of the island's most historic locations. Our reporter Marlon Samuels explores the appeal of Port Royal. With the arrival of thousands of cruise ship passengers and in anticipation of the boost to heritage tourism, 22 residents of Port Royal have been trained as tour guides. Port Royal was once surrounded by water. It was an island was known as Key of the Carina, I mean a beautiful key. All right, all the landmass was formed. The policy that ship that he drove on to get here was formed by the 1692 earthquake. So during the earthquake, rivers from east of Port Royal washed down deposits of silt and sand. The natural current now sort of formed the land. The process takes over 200 years to form. When that process is formed, they call that process land deposition. The town offers a diversity of attractions. Visitors can pay a visit to the museum, where they can see up close relics of the activities of infamous pirates, including the notorious pirate Henry Morgan, who later became the lieutenant governor. Their activities helped Port Royal earn the moniker the wickedest city in the world. You can step out of the museum and stroll through Fort Charles, which was built in the shape of a ship in the 1650s. Originally called Fort Cromwell, it was renamed Fort Charles. The fort, which is well preserved, has a semicircular gun port. It was damaged by both the 1692 Jamaica earthquake and the 1907 Kingston earthquake, which later resulted in the tilting of the building called Giddy House, itself a major attraction. History buffs can also take a leisurely stroll to visit the tomb of Louis Galdi which can be seen at the St. Peter's Anglican Church in Port Royal. Galdi was among the hundreds of people swallowed by the earth in the 1692 earthquake in Port Royal. He lived to tell the tale when the earth reportedly spat him out. The church was also destroyed in the 1692 earthquake. The current church was rebuilt in 1725 when James Clark and Louis Galdi were church wardens. 2 thirds of the original area known as Port Royal lies under 40 feet of water. Fisher folks who live and work in Port Royal are hoping the watery remains of the 17th century city will be developed along with other underwater attractions. that an investor can come in and invest in it. Different, different things, art and craft and, you know, go to the keys, do a little snark around, and a lot of different, different things. But I think it's, it's good for us. Food is a major factor in a tourist's experience. Many are hopeful that visitors to the town will rave about the locally prepared mixed drinks and seafood dishes, for which Port Royal is also famous. For PBCJ News, I am Marlon Samuels.
The business process outsourcing or BPO sector in Jamaica is being repositioned to maximize growth. The Global Services Association of Jamaica will be providing a platform for local technology focused on micro, small and medium-sized enterprises to maximize niche growth in the global services sector. We see BPO is growing steadily and global analysts project that it will continue to grow at about 4% per annum. Um, the market is currently over 200 billion US dollars and it continues to grow. So there is tremendous opportunity in BPO. Ms. Henry also spoke of the association's plans to reposition Jamaica in the global services sector to offer 60% BPO services and 40% knowledge process outsourcing services. This will be a shift from the present situation of 80% and 20% respectively. The president said that work to move the technology-focused MSMEs up the sector's value chain has already started and companies are taking advantage of the assistance. Last year again we launched a program called Scale Up the Value Chain where we, where we hired a consultant through funding from the Inter-American Development Bank to help these small firms digitize their operations and we're helping them to create a roadmap and this roadmap will help them to expand their services those that are primarily in domestic to export to begin to export and to understand what is required for them to tap into the global value chain we're happy to say that 20 firms responded to the call Beginning February, the 20 firms will pitch proposals to a panel of judges from which 10 will be selected to benefit from the digitization of operations and the creation of tailored business roadmaps. GSAJ Vice President and Chief Executive Officer of Night Fox App Design Limited, Egbert von Frankenberg, added his support for this move. He said Jamaica needs to make a full use of its location. We are strategically positioned in Jamaica, as we all know. We are the nearshore market to the U.S. economy. But also what I like to say is we are in the hedge shore of the Western European market. If you look at uh, clients that we have in Western Europe, they prefer working with companies in the Caribbean because of our um, cost-effective services and also because we're seven hours behind Whereas other way around, if they would outsource to India, they would outsource into the future, so to say. So that means when they outsource a product to be worked on overnight into the Caribbean, by the time they wake up in the morning, the product will be complete because they're adding an extra seven, eight hours of the workday. The GSAJ, formerly the Business Process Industry Association of Jamaica, is a 70-member group that represents the interest of the information and communications technology and the outsourcing sectors, which include BPO, KPO, and information technology outsourcing. The police are advising the public that the curfew in Big Lane, Central Village, St. Catherine, has been extended. The curfew began at 6 p.m. on Monday, January 20, and will remain in effect until 6 p.m. on Wednesday, January 22. The boundaries of the curfew are as follows. North, along Mandela Highway, from Central Way to the entrance of Twickenham Park Scheme, McNeil Boulevard. South, along the northern bank of the Rio Kobe River, from the western border at the end of Board Jungle to the eastern border. During the hours of curfew, all persons within the boundaries are expected to remain within their premises unless authorized in writing by the ground commander. The Jamaica Stock Exchange combined index declined marginally on Monday. The JSC combined index declined by 1,646.24 points or 0.3%. The JSC main market index declined by 2,102.93 points or 0.42%, while the junior market index advanced by 26.08 points. The JSE US dollar equities index declined by 10.57 points or 4.07% to close at 237.46. Overall, market activity shows that 78 stocks have traded, 37 advanced, 34 declined, 7 traded firm.
The U.S. dollar is being traded at 139 Jamaican dollars, 17 cents, up by 50 cents. The Canadian dollar is being traded at 107 dollars, 35 cents, down from 107 dollars, 55 cents. While the British pound sterling is being traded at 181 dollars, 45 cents, down from 183 dollars, 31 cents. The data was reported by the Bank of Jamaica's Daily Exchange Trading Summary. In regional news, we start with news from Antigua and Barbuda, where Prime Minister Gaston Brown has dismissed his agriculture minister, Dean Jonas, after indicating that he had for more than six months sought to dissuade the former cabinet minister from, quote, taking decisions that are inimical to good governance, end quote. Brown wrote to Governor General Rodney Williams on Monday, advising him, quote, to terminate the duties and responsibilities, end quote, of Jonas, with immediate effect. The move followed a meeting on Monday between Brown and several workers from the Ministry of Agriculture. In a separate letter to the former minister, Brown informed the parliamentary representative of St. George's constituency that, quote, for more than six months, I have tried to dissuade you from taking decisions that are inimical to good governance and to my government's policy. End quote. St. Kitts and Nevis Foreign Affairs Minister Mark Brantley does not regard the move by the United States to invite some regional countries to a meeting in Jamaica with U.S. Secretary of State Michael Pompeo as means of dividing the 15-member regional integration movement, CARICOM. Pompeo, who is visiting several countries in Latin America, said his two-day visit to Jamaica from Tuesday will allow him to meet with Caribbean leaders to discuss ways of collaborating to promote common democratic values and prosperity. Pompeo said he would also participate in a round table with foreign affairs ministers of Bahamas, Belize, Dominican Republic, Haiti, St. Kitts and Nevis, and St. Lucia. Another issue on the table will be the current situation in Venezuela as Washington continues to lead efforts to remove President Nicolas Maduro from office in the South American country in support of the opposition leader Juan Guaido. Over the weekend, Barbados Prime Minister Mia Motley, who is also chairman of the 15-member Caribbean community CARICOM, warned of the attempt to divide the regional grouping. Brantley said while it is not for him to respond to Motley's statement, he says, quote, I think that each country has bilateral interests, end quote. In sports, a team has been selected by Jamaica Rugby Football Union to represent Jamaica Sevens at the inaugural World Rugby Challenger Series Tournament to be held in Chile and Uruguay from February 15 to February 23. Describing the process as rigorous, head coach Stephen Lewis released the squad listing, commenting that it is a strong squad with a good balance of veterans and younger players. And that's it for the news. Thanks so much for making it PBCJ. Remember, we are the People's Station.